Hey there, welcome back to a special episode of the reshape your health podcast. This is a bonus episode. So if you're watching on YouTube, good for you. You're going to see a ton of graphics today, all about insulin resistance. What, what causes it? What are the symptoms? How do we test for it? What are the treatment protocols? And then also, if you're listening to the podcast, know that you can just go and watch this YouTube video at any time. This was a huge project that I did. It was a recent lecture for third year physical therapy students at the university of Nebraska medical center, where I received my doctorate of physical therapy and insulin resistance is a passion of mine as a geriatric physical therapist. I had to follow the breadcrumb trail to insulin resistance, and I cannot wait for you to just learn all about it today. I think that once you learn how to live a low insulin lifestyle, and start using insulin as the litmus test for whether or not something is healthy for you, losing weight will become so much simpler. And this is an in-depth presentation. Know that I talk quickly and you can always slow the speed down on your podcast or YouTube, or maybe I talk too slowly for you and you can always speed that up as well. Whatever is best for you, that is what I want you to do. So without further ado, let's dive into this presentation. All right. So I called this the key to treating obesity. And I told my members about this project that I was doing and they said, we really want to see the presentation. So I hope that you enjoy this and find it really helpful to understand obesity better on a deeper level and learn, you know, what is insulin resistance? I'm going to explain insulin resistance in depth in this presentation. And if you have questions, or things that you'd like me to dive even deeper into in this presentation, be sure to leave a comment on YouTube. I'm thinking of all sorts of ideas for 2022 for YouTube content, and I'm for sure going to pull some topics out of this presentation and do deeper dive trainings. So I always say, what, what can you expect from me, uh, for the students? I always want them uh, to participate and not give me any awkward silence. So some of these are more for the students. So what you're going to learn today in this presentation is we'll talk about the prevalence of obesity, describe how insulin resistance is really the root cause of obesity. In most cases, describe signs of insulin resistance across the lifespan, explain how insulin resistance contributes to hypertension, dementia, diabetes, cancer, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, arthritis, and more explain how age, sex, genetics, medications, and different lifestyle components all affect insulin. Identify major hormones involved in weight and appetite regulation, discuss science-based nutritional exercise and lifestyle recommendations for sustainable weight loss and disease prevention discuss barriers to implementing evidence-based weight loss strategies. So I asked the students to raise your hands if they had a loved one who was overweight or obese, most all of their hands went up. And then I asked them to keep their hands up. If the same loved one also had high blood pressure or high blood sugar, and most of the hands stayed up. And I said, have you ever wondered why they so often occur together? And for me, I had to follow the breadcrumb trail to insulin resistance. When I was treating geriatric physical therapy clients, I said, why, why do all of them have dementia and heart disease and diabetes? Not all of them, but the majority of them had multiple, multiple comor comorbidities. I said, why is that? Why don't you just have diabetes or just have heart disease or just have excess weight? And as you're going to learn today, it's because insulin resistance is at ground zero for all of them. So if you're new to my channel or new to me, um, I'm Dr. Morgan Nolte. I'm a physical therapist board certified in geriatrics. This is a little snapshot of my beautiful family. So Justin is a farmer. We live in Nebraska. He farms corn and beans, and they just started a little bit of harvest yesterday. This is our daughter, Leah. She's one. And then Dawson is three. And that's a little snapshot of me doing a YouTube thumbnail. I do own my own muscle and fat models. So I'm a little anatomy nerd. 
just a timeline of my education. I went to the University of Nebraska Medical Center for my doctor, doctorate of physical therapy. Right after that, I did a geriatric residency through Creighton University and Hillcrest Health Systems, which is in Omaha and Bellevue, Nebraska. I worked for Hillcrest both in their skilled nursing facility, which is post-acute rehab and home care. And then I started my own weight loss and wellness business in 2018. And then 2019 to 20, um, Creighton asked me to be the geriatric residency program coordinator. And then with COVID that was furloughed. So I went back to home care PRN. So I really enjoy that. I like working with patients, but I love being a business owner and getting to share this kind of information with you so that you can prevent the conditions that I treat in geriatric physical therapy. So first of all, how is obesity classified? The body mass index is a really common tool that's used, but there are definitely some flaws with it. For example, athletes are often classified as being obese because they have a lot of muscle mass. And so they weigh more for their frame than this chart says that they should. Obviously that's not an issue. And sometimes people can be unhealthy at a normal BMI. So we'll talk about why you're not always overweight or obese. If you have insulin resistance, it's really about how healthy are you on the inside? So I gave you the formula for BMI there and the general stats. I'm going to talk through some of the graphics, especially for people on the podcast. So if your BMI is below 18.5, you're considered underweight 18.5 to 24.9 is, is normal quote unquote. 25 to 29.9 is overweight, 30 and above is considered obese. And I also let the students know this is a, an academic presentation. So I definitely use the, the academic terms overweight and obesity. Whenever I'm working with my clients, I don't, I just use excess weight because, um, you know, I don't think that anyone wants to hear that they're obese, understandably. And it's just not a very productive conversation to have with someone, you know, usually they know that they need to lose weight. Usually they, they want to lose weight. They're just not quite sure how here's another graphic that I, I like this so that you can kind of see, um, your weight in pounds and then your height in inches and get a good estimation of where you fall on this BMI chart. Now, this is really interesting. So this website, stateofchildhoodobesity.org, gives maps for adult obesity rates, and they start in 1990. And again, I'm in Nebraska. So I'm just going to use the state of Nebraska as an example to show you how obesity is rising um, over the years. So in here, we're at 1990, and you can see the teal means 10 to about 15% of adults are obese. And that means again, that BMI of 30 or greater. So this does not include people who are in the overweight category. Going to 1995, we turn green. We're at 15 to 19.9% .9 in 2000. Again, we move up another um, percentage of 20 to 24.9. So we're rising at about 1% a year, 2020 or 2005. We kind of stay there, but you can see the Southern United States has rising obesity rates fat, like faster than the rest of the country to 2010. Now Nebraska is in the 25 to 29.9% of adults with obesity in 2015, we rise up to 30 to 34.9. And then in 2019, which is the most recent map they have, we're, we're at 30 to 34.9 still, but a lot of um, America is really moving up to that 35% plus for obesity. I want to show you this chart, which I thought was really interesting. So this shows rates of overweight, which is again, that BMI of 25 to 29.9 and then obesity and then severe obesity. So what we see here is a pretty steady incline of rates of obesity. The solid line is men. The dotted line is women. Again, this is the percentage of adults who have obesity or overweight or severe obesity from 1960 to 1962. And then across the chart, they have a data to about 2018. 
what we see is right around 1976 to 1980, rates of obesity and severe obesity begin to climb. And that's a really important date that we're going to talk about. Now, overall, obesity has stayed pretty steady, or excuse me, overweight. So it really is that obesity and severe obesity that's on the rise. So why? You know, why all of a sudden around 1977, 1980, did obesity start to go up in America? What happened was this McGovern report recommended that Americans consume less sugar and fat laden products. So this was a Senate committee that gave, you know, that wanted the government to start giving nutritional recommendations. And then thereafter, about every five years, they update them with the USDA nutritional guidelines. And the problem here with the USDA being responsible for giving Americans nutrition advice is they're also responsible for keeping people like my husband in business, the farmers, right? So they're, they have competing interests between selling food products and keeping people healthy. And often the food products that they're pushing are actually not, not healthy and fed up is a great documentary. If you haven't watched it yet, it'll certainly give you a swift kick in the pants to not want to eat sugar. Um, so what happened here after this 1977 McGovern report was that the dairy sugar and meat industries, right. were worried about their profits because this report said eat less sugar and fat. And they banded together to reject the statements from the McGovern report. And then those recommendations were rewritten to encourage consumers to buy more lean products as opposed to less of the rich ones. And then the food industry adapted by re-engineering so many of their products to be low fat. So this is really where the low fat era started. And we saw, we have seen a steady incline, a steady rise in obesity and severe obesity since this moment in time. So we started um, eating less fat and we started getting fatter, essentially. When you remove the fat from food, it doesn't taste good. And so food manufacturers had to process it and usually they make it taste better by adding sugar. And I always like to remind people that this bag of sugar up here is 100% fat free, but it doesn't matter what it is on the label. It matters what your body does with it after you eat it. Some products, especially yogurt are labeled low fat, but they actually contain twice as much sugar as the original full fat versions. And another thing that really happened was food became more processed in general and portions became larger. So you can see here in this picture of 1960, you know, a, a modest hamburger and some, a small fry and a small drink was the normal meal. And now we have super size, everything super size me was an interesting documentary. I remember watching in high school about a man who ate McDonald's every day. I don't know how long he made it, but he became metabolically sick very quickly from eating all that processed food. Some more startling facts. So up until now, I've only been speaking of obesity, but when you combine overweight and obesity, now we're at more than seven out of every 10 American adults over 20 have either overweight or obesity. And then when we're talking about children, it's startling as well. So the percentage of children aged two to 19 with overweight, including obesity. So they are either overweight or obese is 35.4%. So over three out of every 10 children are now, um, at, honestly at a metabolic disadvantage and they are going to have to deal with those emotional consequences, maybe not participating in, in sports at the level that they want to maybe getting teased. I mean, this is a real problem, not just from a physical standpoint, but especially for children from a mental health standpoint. And then six, since 1980, Obesity rates among teens aged 12 to 19 quadrupled. So again, I'm going to read that again. Since 1980, obesity rates, BMI of 30 or more among teens ages 12 to 19 quadrupled from 5% to 20.6%.
Why do we care? Right? Because obesity has been shown to increase the risk of overall mortality. So death from any cause, high blood pressure, high LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, and high levels of triglycerides. And I'll talk later about cholesterol and why I do not care if someone has high total or elevated LDL cholesterol, unless I know more, I need to know what types of LDL cholesterol they have and what their HDL and triglyceride levels are doing as well. You can't just say someone's unhealthy because they have high LDL or high total cholesterol. It increases the chance of type two diabetes heart disease, stroke, gallbladder disease, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea and breathing problems, chronic inflammation and increased oxidative stress, some cancers, including endometrial, breast, colon, kidney, gallbladder, and liver, depression, anxiety, dementia, body pain, and difficulty with physical functioning and a lower quality of life. That's the main one here, right? Obesity really reduces your quality of life. Money, money, money. Why else do we care? Obesity is associated with additional medical expenditures and indirect costs from lost productivity, absenteeism, and disability claims. So some interesting facts here. In 2010, obesity was associated with additional costs of about $4,800 for a woman and $2,600 for a man, direct costs. But the value of life lost for premature death, because remember obesity is directly associated with all cause mortality, all cause death due to obesity is $50,000 per year, raising the estimated annual costs of obesity to about 8,300 per woman and 6,500 per man with obesity. Some other facts here on the cost of obesity. It says the top three conditions with the highest expenses attributed to overweight and obesity. And this was in 2014 were hypertension or high blood pressure, type two diabetes and chronic back pain. So there's some startling facts there, but the direct and indirect medical costs attributed to obesity in 2014 alone was $1.4 trillion. So we need to, to take a step back and think about what really causes obesity. And to do that, we have to ask a, a question of what is obesity? Well, it's just an excessive amount of body fat. What causes an excessive, an excessive amount of body fat? Is it too many calories or is it too much insulin? Well, a calorie is simply a unit of energy defined as the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And in all of my studies of anatomy and physiology, I have never seen a calorie receptor on a cell doesn't exist. There is sufficient evidence to prove that calorie restricted diets continue to lack long-term efficacy, meaning they do not work for sustainable weight loss. I like to say crash diets, crash your metabolism. You're going to learn why, or is it too much insulin? Is that what's causing obesity? And it is insulin is an anabolic hormone. That means that it builds up. So among other things in your body, what we're going to focus on today is the fact that insulin promotes glucose or blood sugar update of uptake into your cells glycogenesis, which is the creation of glycogen in your muscle and your liver tissue and lipogenesis, which is the creation of fat cells. Insulin is your fat creation and storage hormone. And every cell in your body has an insulin receptor. So calories alone is an ineffective thing to focus on when you're focusing on fat loss. You want to focus on how do I keep my insulin low? Because that's the hormone that's going to create and store fat. I like this picture. So I wanted to, if you're not familiar with this physiology, there's something called the glute four transporter. 
and it hangs out in your cell. And then when insulin binds to its receptor, it moves up to the cell membrane, almost like a tube slide. And then glucose or blood sugar can go from your bloodstream, which I'm pointing out here into your cell. The other thing that moves this glute four transport protein to the cell membrane to allow blood glucose to come into your cell is exercise. So exercise can, I like to say exercise can, um, pull, uh, glucose into the cell because it needs energy or insulin can let it slide down or push it into the cell. So Dr. Jason Fung, um, he's the author of many books, but one of them is the obesity code, which is a fabulous book. If you want to learn a little bit more about the hormonal aspect of obesity and insulin resistance, he says, obesity is a hormonal, not caloric problem. Let's talk about why insulin controls your body weight. It's really important here to recognize that the level of body fatness that you have is hormonally controlled. It is not volitionally controlled. Your body likes to automate as much as possible. And it likes something called homeostasis where things remain steady. You know, that's why we always have a very tight range for pH in our body and temperature. That's why our heart rate is steady. Most of the time, why our breathing rate is steady. We don't volitionally control how fast our heart beats or how fast we breathe or how fast our, our hair and our nails grow. We also don't volitionally control our body set weight. It's an automatic process that your body does. And it happens in your brain, just like all other hormonal processes. It really comes from the brain starts from the brain. So brain insulin action, what research has found, there's a ton of references at the end of this presentation, but insulin in the brain, because remember the brain has insulin receptors regulates eating behavior. Brain insulin resistance impairs the central nervous control over peripheral energy metabolism in visceral adipose tissue, which is the unhealthy type of fat that we store underneath our abdominal muscle layers and it encroaches our internal organs and it's more inflammatory and then fat in the liver. So harmful effects of body fat is mainly determined by its location. I know that a lot of women hate, you know, their thighs or their butt and they, you know, they want to lose body fat there. And that's actually where our fat is supposed to be stored. That's called subcutaneous fat. It's above the muscle layer, but under the sit under the skin, that's what subcutaneous means. And again, that visceral fat is around your abdominal organs and it encroaches them and it impairs their function. And visceral fat is also known to release cytokines and inflammatory things, which further increases insulin resistance. So it's not unhealthy in and of itself to be overweight. If most of that weight is stored outside of the visceral area, when it comes to weight control, your hypothalamus is a crucial region in the brain. And this study here found that brain insulin sensitivity is linked to total body fat and its distribution, right? So that's really important to note that different tissues in your body can exhibit insulin resistance at different rates. And when your brain becomes insulin resistant, you will have an increase in body fat and you will have more of it distributed around your midsection. Let's take a look at that visceral versus subcutaneous fat. So here that SBC is subcutaneous under the skin. And then the visceral is the stuff. This is, um, a, a sagittal view. So across, you know, they cut someone in half and you're looking at them from the side. And then this VSC is visceral fat. So this is the lowest risk for like cardiovascular disease, um, moderate risk, right? And then the highest risk here would be a lot of visceral fat. So if you see a guy with a beer gut, 
Um, that's pro he probably a grain belly. We like to call that sometimes that's unhealthy fat. If you can't grab it with your hands, that means it's visceral belly fat. Here's another picture here. Um, this is from an MRI and this person on the left, I just wanted to point out the subcutaneous versus the visceral fat. So all of this on top of the muscle is subcutaneous. And then all of this inside, that's the visceral fat. So fat is supposed to be stored here as I'm outlining on top of your muscles, not in here. Okay. And I, I you know, most people, it's okay to have some fat. We need some fat on our bodies. So most everyone has a little bit um, in both places. So let's talk a little bit more about brain insulin sensitivity, specifically the hypothalamic insulin response. So insulin sensitivity is the opposite of insulin resistance. So I might use both terms and I didn't want you to be confused. Insulin sensitivity is the opposite of insulin resistance. So the more insulin sensitive you are, the less insulin resistant you are. And the more insulin resistant you are, the less insulin sensitive you are. And what this study looked at was they looked at a reduction of blood flow after intranasal. So up the nose insulin application. And that reduction of blood flow indicates higher brain insulin sensitivity. Okay. And what was interesting was the people who had more hypothalamic insulin sensitivity before losing weight, they lost more weight during the first nine months of a two-year intervention. They had a favorable ratio of subcutaneous to visceral fat, lower fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C less weight regain, less total and visceral fat. So what the study shows is that association between uh, brain insulin sensitivity and all of these factors, including how fast you lose weight, where your how much total body fat you have, where it's stored, your fasting glucose and A1C and weight regain. So here's a picture of the hypothalamus right there. It's in the middle of the brain. And hunger and satiety or fullness, I'm going to use that word satiety. And what I mean is fullness. Here's a, I'm going to move my computer just a little bit for the sun glare. If you're watching on YouTube. So this is complex. You know, we like to think that we can volitionally control how much we eat and it is so hard to do that. And if you've done restricted calorie diets, you know, that hunger can be just so hard to control. That's because it involves complex interactions between hormones from your gut, from your gastrointestinal tract and to the hypothalamus in the brain, and then feedback back and forth. And some of the primary hormones that, that deal with this hunger and satiety are ghrelin, which is also known as your hunger hormone leptin, which is your fat sensing hormone. And I have specific YouTube videos on both of those. I'll link those in the description below this video, um, insulin, which is your fat storing hormone, and then over nine gut hormones. So ghrelin and hunger, let's talk about that. Ghrelin is produced in the gut and signals hunger to the lateral hypothalamus in your brain. Activity of those neurons in your lateral hypothalamus is increased during eating, during feeding behavior. So they have literally studied what your nerve, your neurons are doing in the brain and what activity they have when you're eating. And what was interesting was stimulating those neurons or electrical brain stimulation experience have shown that activation of that same region, that lateral hypothalamus can trigger voracious eating in animals, even when they are fully fed. And another study showed that the lateral hypothalamus is responsible in part for learning about food predictive cues in the environment. In other words, where food is, where can I get food and lesions, or if, if this part of the brain is hurt or isn't working properly of this brain structure, this lateral hypothalamus result in markedly decreased food consumption and starvation. So 
hunger, ghrelin signals this lateral hypothalamus to make us want to eat. And if there's a problem with that lateral hypothalamus, we are at risk of starvation. Okay. This is a, a table that shows different GI hormones that affect satiation or fullness. I just wanted to show you that hormones affect your food intake. So I'm not going to read all of them. I'm going to be talking about CCK. Um, I think GLP one and peptide YY and ghrelin most today. So some, most of the hormones are going to reduce food intake, but ghrelin is that one again, that acts on that hypothalamic region to increase food intake. Short-term fullness or satiety signals that contribute to a sense of fullness are CCK or cholecystokinin and gut distension or how much your belly stretches when you're eating. That's why you get more full. If you have water before your meal or a big salad with your meal, and then long acting satiety signals that will inhibit eating after your meal are peptide YY and glucagon like peptide one or GLP one. And really those also, from what I've researched, have somewhat of a short-term satiety signal as well. So they might assist with both short and long-term satiety. Now, leptin is another important hormone that I touched on. And this, this leptin is derived from fat cells. That's this adipocyte. And it sends signals to the medial hypothalamus regarding energy story storage within your body, i.e. how much body fat you have. That's why I call leptin your fat sensing hormone. Okay. And leptin again, that fat cell derived hormone inhibits the lateral hypothalamus and suppresses the hunger stimulating effects of ghrelin. So that it works in this yin and yang type of situation where leptin, when, like when you, when you eat and you gain body fat, that will inhibit the appetite stimulating effects of ghrelin signaling to you that, Hey, I have enough fat for now. I don't need it. I know I don't need to eat any more food. And so it inhibits ghrelin and that's how your appetite is supposed to work. Now let's talk about your body set weight. And this is the preferred level of body fatness essentially where your body wants to stay. So if you're familiar with losing weight and then regaining it to about the same level that you lost it, like, let's say you were 170 and you got down to 150 and then slowly, but surely you regained it to 170, maybe even a little bit higher. That's because that's your body set weight. So body fat stores will influence appetite and energy expenditure in a coordinated manner to regulate body weight. Okay. Your body, again, it doesn't like change. It likes homeostasis. So when it senses a decrease or increase in fat, it's going to adjust your metabolism and hunger accordingly to get you back to your body set weight. So changes in energy balance or that are sufficient to alter body fat stores are signaled via leptin. Okay. And that acts in the brain to elicit compensatory changes in order to match energy intake to energy expenditure. So we used to think that calories in was independent of calories out. And this research study really disproved that it, it said that, Hey, when you eat less to try to lose weight, we're going to slow your metabolism down. <laughs> when you eat more, we're going to speed your metabolism up. So that was a really important finding there that these compensatory changes make you want to match your energy intake without take with your, um, energy expenditure and body set weight is best understood as a negative feedback loop between insulin, your fat storage hormone and leptin, your fat sensing hormone. And Jason Fung did such a good job um, explaining that in the obesity code. 
And here's a picture of it. So when we eat, especially when we eat carbohydrates, our insulin will go up. We will gain fat because insulin is your fat creation and storage hormone. You gain fat. When you gain fat, you're going to release more leptin. That's that hormone, that fat sensing hormone that tells your brain how much body fat you have. And then your brain, because leptin suppresses ghrelin, suppresses your hunger hormone, you'll have a lower appetite and you'll eat less to use what energy is available. When you eat less, not just less calories, but just less in general, or maybe you don't snack again until your next meal, that's going to help lower your insulin. Okay. So that's that negative feedback loop when it's working correctly. Now here's what happens when it's not working. Any elevated substance for any period of time will lead to resistance. So think of it like alcohol resistance or antibiotic resistance. Maybe they got a buzz after two drinks, but then over the years, it takes four and then five and then six drinks to get that same buzz. The same thing is going on with your insulin. If you're constantly stimulating your insulin to be released, say for example, through chronic stress or a diet that's high in processed foods or refined carbohydrates, you're going to require high levels of insulin and your brain will become desensitized to its effects so that it needs more. And you're not just your brain, you know, but your cells and your muscles and your liver and your fat, where energy is being deposited, those become resistant to insulin. So your pancreas has to make more and more is present in the blood to get the same, um, to, to keep your blood glucose stable because that's insulin's role is to keep that blood glucose in tight regulation um, of a fasting level of 70 to hundred being considered normal. So what's really interesting is that in Dr. Bickman's book, why we get sick, there was a line that said fasting insulin can predict type two diabetes up to two decades before fasting glucose. So I thought that was a really interesting fact, but when your blood levels of insulin go up, that goes to your brain too. And so high insulin again, makes you gain fat, which increases leptin and, but leptin is high too. And so your brain will become resistant to the appetite suppressing effects of leptin and you get leptin resistance. And then your body, your body essentially is unregulated in how much fat it thinks it needs to store. And while you keep gaining weight, your appetite doesn't go down anymore. And it's lost that ability to regulate itself. And so Dr. Fung has this really great analogy of a thermostat in a house. Like, let's say you're setting your house thermostat to 72 degrees. And that's your, that's uh, analogous to your body set weight. And then you do a diet, right? You cut 500 calories a day and you might lose some weight. That's like putting an air, like a room air conditioner in a room. It might get, it might get colder, but eventually your body set weight will kick in. Eventually the thermostat will kick in and heat the room back up. No matter how, how much you're running that air conditioner, it's still, it's not going to work. No matter how much you're cutting calories, it's not going to work because your body adjusts and it compensates to make you regain the weight. If you're only focused on cutting calories. So there is a way for sustainable weight loss that we'll talk about really interesting study here that showed changes in energy expenditure resulting from an altered body weight. Okay. And they found that compensatory metabolic processes, um, resist the maintenance of the altered body weight. So what happens, this was their initial weight. So they, the study had some people gain 10% of their weight. And what this shows is how many more or less calories they burned, um, from the expected amount that they, that the researchers had said they should burn. So the people that gained 10% of their body weight burned about 500 more calories a day from their baseline. So their body was tr actively trying to lose the weight. And it does that 
but it can't keep up with that forever. So that's eventually where the hormonal resistance kicks in. People that lost 10 or 20% of their body weight showed that their metabolism slowed down by about 300 calories a day. And then when these people returned to their initial weight, they still were burning less calories than what they even were before at that initial weight. So their metabolism had slowed down even after they regained the weight. So what's interesting is this is, this was just one other study on before I actually, before I go to this one, I, I think that this is, um, later in the presentation, but I wanted to show you this metabolic change of a slower metabolism lasts four, six months to four years. So you have to have such strong self-control to not gain more weight than you lost. And that's why, because those, the negative uh, metabolic change lasts six months to four years. So let's talk about weight gain over time. This was from the Australian longitudinal study on women's health, and it studied over 8,000 women, 45 to 55 years old. They completed mail-in surveys in 1996, 1998, and 2001. The researchers found an average weight gain of about one pound per year. What that reflects is a positive energy accumulation of only about 10 calories a day. So if you eat 10 calories a day more, like if you're going on the caloric model of obesity, you would gain a pound a year. No one can control how many calories they eat or burn within that tight of a range. It is unrealistic. So your weight is tightly controlled by your hormones. And again, it's unrealistic to think that you can volitionally control caloric intake and caloric expenditure to that tight of a margin of less than 10 calories a day. So weight gain over time. These were some factors that the researchers found were related to women who gained more than a pound a year. So women who gained more than a pound of a pound a year were more likely to have quit smoking, were more likely to report low, very low or no physical activity. And that was measured in they had less than 150 minutes per week. Women who reported more than four and a half hours of sitting per day, women who were perimenopausal. And those who became postmenopausal during the study period gained more weight. And then women who had a recent or prior hysterectomy or surgical menopause also gained more weight. And you're going to learn later in the presentation why all of this is. Okay. And I can tell you this, it's not for, um, for burning calories. So this is where I talked about that six months to four years thing. So the rise in ghrelin during diet induced weight loss, in other words, the rise in hunger when you're losing weight was a predictor of weight regain and concentrations remained elevated over time, suggesting a small, but significant drive to regain the weight. And that was a study in 2021, a very recent study, a reduced level of energy expenditure or how many calories you burn in a day has been reported to persistent subjects who have maintained a reduced body weight for periods ranging from six months to more than four years. So I know that that's pretty disheartening there, but one of my clients recently said, I said, you know, how, how's it been going over this last week? And she goes, I'm finally not hungry. You know, I have her on a high protein, high fat diet. And she's used to starving herself and severe restriction. And she was so pleasantly surprised that she was not hungry. And there are strategies that we can do to keep, to kind of trick your hormones when you're losing weight to not make you want to eat more. So here's the bottom line on why most diets fail. Losing weight leads to increased ghrelin, your hunger hormone or appetite and sustained reduced metabolic rate, basal metabolic rate, or a lower metabolism for six months to four years to make you regain the weight. So what's the solution here? 
how should we eat to make it more likely that we will maintain our weight loss? Well, this research study looked at the difference between low carb, high protein versus low fat, high carb diets. And what I want you to think of here, even if you're not familiar with the concept, we'll talk about it later is I want you to read that as low insulin versus high insulin diets, because carbohydrates have the highest insulin response out of all of the macronutrients. So a low carb, high protein diet will be a low insulin response diet and a low fat, high carb diet will be a high insulin response diet. Now they looked at 13 randomized controlled trials, which is the gold standard for research between, well, a randomized control trial is the gold standard. So they looked at 13 of those between 2000 and 2007, all of those different randomized control trials compared the efficacy of low carb, high protein versus low fat, low calorie diets. So this was not just one study. It was a review of 13 of them. And what they found was that weight loss was significantly greater in the low carb, high protein group after six and 12 months compared with the low fat, high carbohydrate group. They also found that HDL triglycerides, glucose, and systolic blood pressure had improved in the low carb, high protein diet versus the low fat, high carb group. Now here's something that's really interesting the low carb, high protein diet increased total and LDL cholesterol compared to the low fat, high carb diets. And we're going to look at what that means and when we should care a little bit later on. Let's talk about macronutrients and weight regain. So that was one randomized control trial. This that looked at 13 studies. This was another really interesting study. And it looked at how macronutrient composition affected energy expenditure. So how many calories we burn and subsequent weight regain. And this was a smaller study. So 21 men and women aged age 18 to 40 with a body mass index or BMI of 27 or higher. And they did this run and diet to lose 12.5%. And I'm referencing the, the study a little bit, you know, later on, if you want to go look it up for what exactly was in the run and diet, the low fat, the low glycemics and the very low carb, but you can see at least here, the targeted macronutrient distribution percentage of energy. So in the run and diet, 45% of their calories were coming from carbohydrates, 30% from fat, 25% from protein. They ate that at a reduced caloric level until they lost 12.5% of their body weight. And then those participants were stratified to three diets, either low fat, low glycemic index, or very low carbohydrate. So this research study really tested, does the diet composition affect weight regain? And then they tested after seven months, which isn't very long, um, from a weight regain standpoint, but it was interesting results. So the low fat diet composition was 60% carbohydrate, 20% of calories from fat, 20% of calories from protein, and then 40% of cal then the low glycemic index. So glycemic index is how much a food will affect blood sugar. Low glycemic index diet had 40% of carbohydrates, 40% of fat and 20% of protein. And then the very low carbohydrate diet mimicked the Atkins with 10% carbohydrate, 60% fat, 30% protein. Here's what they found. The low fat diet produced changes in energy expenditure and serum leptin that would predict weight regain. In other words, their leptin went down which would increase ghrelin, your hunger hormone, and make you want to eat and regain the weight. The conventionally recommended diet, which is the low fat, high carb, that is what the government recommends as a healthy lifestyle, even though 85% of adults in America have insulin resistance. 
So all of these government recommendations are not made for 85% of the population. Can you tell that frustrates me a little bit? <laughs> so in addition, this conventionally recommended diet had unfavorable, unfavorable effects on most of the metabolic syndrome components studied, including insulin sensitivity, HDL, triglycerides, blood pressure, and stress and inflammation. So the low fat, high carb diet, that's, if you look at like the, my plate that the government currently recommends now, that's pretty much a low fat, high carb diet. And it's going to make you more insulin resistant. It's going to reduce your HDL. It's going to increase your triglycerides and blood pressure and stress and inflammation. Now, the very low carbohydrate diet had the most beneficial effects on energy expenditure and several metabolic components. So this would be like a keto or an Atkins diet, but however, this is really interesting. This restrictive regimen may increase cortisol, which is your stress hormone, um, and increase CRP, which is a marker of inflammation. And I think that's why a lot of people will plateau on keto is because their metabolic stress might be going up. And I'm, you know, I'm not, if you know my philosophy, I am not anti-plant-based. I'm not pro keto. I'm not anti or pro pretty much anything. I'm like, let's look at the science and stop calling it a diet. There is no uh, proper diet. This is a lifestyle change. So we never, ever have to be perfect, but I love looking at this research and kind of saying, oh, well, that makes sense why people plateau on keto. The low glycemic index diet, which was that one kind of in the middle, that one replaced some of the carbohydrates with more fibrous and fat, like healthy fat sources. Um, I think it had a similar amount of protein, if I'm not mistaken, as the low fat diet, but that one appeared, it was just, it was lower carb, higher fat compared to the low fat. And it had qualitatively similar, although smaller metabolic benefits to the very low carbohydrate diet possibly without the negative effects on the cortisol and the CRP. So stress and chronic inflammation. So what this finding uh, suggests is that a strategy to reduce glycemic load or blood sugar response from a meal and therefore insulin response from a meal, rather than reducing dietary fat may be more advantageous for weight loss maintenance and cardiovascular disease prevention. So personally, I think that they were pretty close. If I back up the slides here with, um, their macronutrient breakdown, I typically recommend people start at one gram of protein per ideal, uh, pound of body weight. So for example, uh, for, for most women that might fall between 120 to 150 uh, grams of protein. And then I recommend about 80 grams of net carbs is a nice place to start. I'm not saying you have to do that every single day. You might have lower days and higher days, but that would probably be closer to 25 to 30% of carbohydrates. And then for fat, I'd probably up that to 50%. And so my current recommendations for, for women are to follow that low glycemic index diet, but even bias a little bit more towards the lower carb, higher fat, higher protein. So I was happy to see that my recommendations were really in line with the study. So let's talk about inflammation and regain. This was an interesting one too. They said that weight loss induces an inflammatory response in adipose tissue. Like your fat cells don't know what's going on. Uh, they said the loss of fat mass induces shrinkage of adipocyte or adipocytes or fat cells, which led to cellular stress, inflammation, um, and then altered adipokine or just different hormones um, and substances released by fat cells. Uh, reduced, um, like leptin, for example, adipokine secretion and reduced fat breakdown or lipolysis. But they found that vitamins like thiamine, riboflavin, and folate, minerals like magnesium and zinc, fiber, and omega 3 fatty acids, which are all anti inflammatory nutrients, showed a correlation with reduced weight regain. So that's exciting too. I think that's why getting those micronutrients, 
um, and enough fiber and enough omega-3 fatty acids, especially from bioavailable sources like fatty fish and green algae can be so beneficial because when we reduce inflammation, we reduce insulin resistance. So it really all ties back into insulin. And that's why I think we're asking the wrong question. So for these YouTube videos, I really do a lot of keyword research. And I think, what are people searching for and how can I make a video to target that keyword? So more people will see it. And when I do this, I, I see that, um, 450,000 people a month search for how to lose weight. Maybe that's what I should name this video. I don't know what I'm going to name it yet, but only 2,400 a month are searching for how to lower insulin. And we're, we're truly asking the wrong question. So focusing on, on reducing calories is not effective for long-term weight loss, but focusing on insulin is you have to outsmart and outlast your hormones to lose weight and keep it off. Here are some really excellent, um, examples of how and why insulin controls weight. So look at a type one versus type two diabetic. Type one diabetics don't make insulin. So they do not have the hormone that will move that GLUT4 transporter to the cell membrane and, and allow glucose to move from the bloodstream into the cell. The only way they can get it in there is through exercise. So what happens is their cells are starving for energy, energy because it can't get into the cell. So they have very high levels of blood sugar, which will cause high levels of thirst. And because their cells think they're starving, they send a ton of, of hunger cues to the brain and they are just hungry all the time, but they can't gain weight. So insulin, they, they don't have insulin and they cannot gain weight. Very important link there versus someone with type two diabetes. Often we say, well, they don't have enough insulin and that's not true. They have an excessive amount of insulin for too long, leading to resistance. Now their blood sugar becomes elevated because their pancreas cannot make enough insulin to keep up with their elevated blood sugar. So that's kind of a classic example, but people with type two diabetes often see fat mass gain or weight gain. Again, it's not always strictly about the weight. I evaluated, um, a home care client recently and she was five, eight, 150 pounds with an a one C a hemoglobin, a one C of 10. So that's how high your blood sugars have been over the last three months. And that is very poorly controlled type two diabetes. And you could tell she had a lot of, not a lot of muscle mass, a lot of fat mass, um, but she was not overweight. So that's why it's really important that we don't only look at BMI. And then this study showed that type two diabetes, type two diabetics who go on insulin gain weight because that insulin goes up in your brain and it just kind of sets your uh, body set weight higher and higher. Now menopause, we know that estrogen is protective against insulin and visceral fat. That's why women going through perimenopause and menopause as they see their estrogen drop see an increase in, um, visceral or belly fat and overall weight gain age. We know that there's a reduced quantity and quality of muscle mass known as sarcopenia. There's a lot that we can do to mitigate that, but it, it happens. So age reduces muscle mass and muscle is like a garage for your glucose. Okay. That's where that glycogen is stored. And when you have less muscle mass, you have less insulin receptors, and then you'll have less kind of place to store that glucose and it stays elevated in your blood. And then you need more insulin. Also hormone downregulation. You're going to have less testosterone, less human growth hormone with age. And that in and of itself can, um, lead to poorer muscle quality, a harder time building muscle, and also just a reduced metabolic rate. Another example of, of how, why insulin or how insulin controls weight would be when you have to take steroids, corticosteroids can cause insulin resistance and weight gain pregnancy and puberty. 
this is my favorite. So, you know, I gained close to 40 pounds with each of my pregnancies and I certainly did not, I mean, I ate more, but I didn't eat enough to gain 40 pounds. I did not eat the caloric equivalent to gain 40 pounds, but research has shown this one was from 2019. Um, they they've tested insulin resistance throughout the pregnancy and you get more and more insulin resistant and you gain more weight. So great examples of insulin controlling weight. So I talk a lot about insulin resistance It's really nailed down what it is. Insulin resistance is the inability of insulin to stimulate glucose disposal. Okay. It can no longer keep up with the level of glucose in your, in your blood to maintain that level of homeostasis. It results in a compensatory increase in insulin production. More is needed. Then you develop what's called hyperinsulinemia and eventually type two diabetes. And again, type two diabetes is diagnosed when your fasting blood sugar is 126 or higher on two separate readings. Prediabetes is about 100, 101 to 125 fasting. And I mentioned this earlier, but fasting insulin can predict type two diabetes up to two decades before fasting glucose, 85% of adults are insulin resistant, a startling fact. And I, I just mentioned that client who was five, eight and one fifty was not obese, but was certainly insulin resistant evidenced by her a one C of 10. It's really caused by hyperinsulinemia. So insulin resistance is caused by too much insulin for too long. And your cells become more insulin resistant over time. It's like rust. It doesn't just happen overnight. And then more insulin is needed, right? More insulin goes in your blood and your brain, and it sets your body weight up. This comes from Dr. Benjamin Bickman, his book, why we get sick, a couple of these graphics. So he suggests that fasting insulin ideally is less than six. Normal is eight to nine. And we don't want to be normal in this, in this case, because there was a stat in his book. I think it was, if your fasting insulin is like eight, you have twice the, twice the risk of getting diabetes, um, as if it was a five. So they haven't done as much research here because insulin is hard to test. That's why um, there are hard, you know, consensus for blood glucose levels, but not as hard of a consensus for blood insulin levels. I've done a video before on the HOMA IR score that I'll link below this video. And that's the homeostatic model assessment for insulin resistance. Again, HOMA IR, and that's going to test. It's a test using fasting glucose and insulin. It's an equation. And on this slide, I just have the one for America, but Dr. Bickman's book. Um, and then that other video also has, um, the formula for most other countries. So it's glucose times insulin divided by four Oh five. And there's no consensus yet, but a value over 1.5 indicates insulin resistance and above three usually means you're on the borderline of having type two diabetes. So as a geriatric PT following the breadcrumbs, this is what I was following. Okay. The metabolic consequences of insulin resistance can result in hyperglycemia. That's elevated blood glucose, hypertension, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, altered blood lipids, like high triglycerides, low HDL, elevated, unhealthy LDL, visceral adiposity. So more belly fat, hyperuricemia, so elevated uric acid, elevated inflammatory markers, which can lead to endothelial dysfunction right next, um, and heart disease. And then a prothrombic state, meaning you're more likely to have a stroke, um, or a blood clot. These are from 2021, very, very recent research. And these were the breadcrumbs. I said, why do all of my patients have not all of them, but why do so many of my patients have so many of these things? And it's because insulin resistance contributed to all of them, but insulin resistance was not on their past medical history. Here's what was on their past medical history, because risk factors like those left untreated turn into disease. And I have not found a better book than why we get sick by Dr. Bickman on 
how well he explains how the physiologic, the physiology between, between how insulin resistance directly contributes to all of these diseases regarding heart health. Those risk factors that I mentioned will lead to atherosclerosis, inflammation with brain health, Alzheimer's disease. So what's really interesting is if you look up, um, research on Alzheimer's disease, some people are now calling it type three diabetes or brain insulin resistance. And the XX brain by Dr. Moscone talks about how these changes in our brain that are the beginning markers of Alzheimer's start in middle age in our forties and fifties, she could see um, evidence of those brain changes. So if you're not, and they, and they accelerate after menopause. So if you're not proactively taking care of your health, like in your forties and fifties, you should really consider. Otherwise you've got to start prioritizing your health now so that we avoid these diseases in the future. Other things that insulin resistance has been associated with are vascular dementia. It's a different type of dementia than Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's and migraines regarding reproductive health, polycystic ovarian syndrome, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, low testosterone, low, low sperm count and erectile dysfunction. We know that a woman's level of estrogen or of, um, insulin is passed down to the fetus. And I think that's one of the reasons we see such a rise in childhood obesity it isn't just environmental. It's, it's what blood are they getting from their mother? What hormones are they getting from their mother? And then cancer again, breast, prostate, colorectal aging. So insulin resistance is associated with less muscle, reduced bone mass, reduced bone mass or osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. And then for endocrine obesity and diabetes, isn't it interesting that at the beginning of this presentation, I said, obesity was associated with many of these things, but I hope that you see now it's really insulin resistance. That's it kind of ground zero for all of these things. So Charles Harris is actually an attorney from California and he reached out to me. We've been in correspondence. He's a huge insulin resistance advocate and has a really neat story. And he uh, lives in Thailand and has been advocating for that government to really make changes based on a low insulin lifestyle. And I use that phrase, low insulin lifestyle. And even like five years ago, he kind of, he coined the phrase insulin friendly lifestyle. So it's just really cool. Uh, what the internet can do to bring uh, such similar minds together. And so this is the yellow brick road of insulin resistance. And this is your twenties, your thirties, your forties, your fifties, your sixties. Okay. And we're and when we're 20, we're young and healthy 30 to 40. If you're not making those low insulin lifestyle changes, you're going to get hyperinsulinemia. And then again, it's like rust. It develops over time. You're going to get insulin diseases like metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, more visceral fat, fatty liver disease. Now, starting in your sixties, I've seen this over and over. If you do not take care of yourself by the time you hit 60, you will feel it. And you will have diagnosed conditions like hypertension, heart disease, liver disease, type two diabetes, Alzheimer's, obesity, cancer, PCOS, which I think, you know, obviously is going to be diagnosed maybe younger in a woman's life with, um, reproductive years but it happened. This is such a great graphic from Charles on what happens and how hyperinsulinemia can just lead to these chronic diseases. So Occam's razor states that the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. And for me, the simplest explanation is that if insulin resistance is at ground zero for all of these risk factors that lead to disease, Instead of treating diseases in silos, why don't we just treat insulin resistance? Cause that would make everything else better. So what increases insulin resistance? Once we know this, we can reverse engineer our way back into our healthy lifestyle that leads to low insulin levels genetics. As I said, this 2019 study showed that maternal hyperglycemia or high blood sugar leads to fetal high blood sugar and hyperinsulinemia for the vast majority of people. Our genes are not as important as what we do with them. That's from Dr. Bickman. Ethnicity can impact insulin resistance. Um, I found that non-Hispanic whites and African-Americans actually have greater insulin sensitivity than his Hispanic whites, 
South Asian and East Asian. Age, again, decreased estrogen, testosterone, human growth hormone, and muscle will increase insulin resistance. Your hormones, obviously insulin, most commonly due to lifestyle. Epinephrine and cortisol are two stress hormones. Cortisol is a really important one to know about um, because it increases insulin resistance directly. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but it also selectively drives visceral fat to grow more than subcutaneous fat. It's fascinating. Stress causes belly fat. It causes your fat to move towards your visceral deposits instead of your subcutaneous. So back in the day when you had stress, caveman times, you had to fight a saber tooth tiger or fight someone else in a tribe in order to fight or flee, you need energy. You need energy in the form of glucose. So cortisol causes a release of glucose into your blood so that your muscles can either fight or flee. But the problem with today's stressors, it's usually like an email from a boss or something that we see on the news or a phone call. We're in COVID right now. So maybe you get a phone call that a loved one has COVID that does not really require you to fight or flee. So your blood sugar is not being pulled in by the muscle demand, which requires an increase in insulin to get that blood sugar from the bloodstream into your cells. So hypothyroidism is also indicative of insulin resistance, having low thyroid central obesity. Again, just like I said, that visceral fat increases inflammation and oxidative stress compared to subcutaneous fat, fat cell hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. This is really interesting from Dr. Ben Bigman's book. He does a great job explaining this, that it's better to have more smaller fat cells because there's more surface area for more insulin receptors. And that's hyperplasia more in number. It's better to have that than few larger fat cells or hypertrophy larger in size. The insulin resistant fat cell that has grown beyond its borders, not only leaks fat, but because it's too big, it also becomes inflamed, dumping inflammatory proteins into the blood. Here's a picture of this. These are fat cells and then insulin growth. It's going to signal either, I mean, the fat cells have to grow some way. They're either going to grow in number or size. So here's a, a visual of that hyperplasia, more smaller fat cells. They're more insulin sensitive, also known as healthy fat. Now these two factors for H and E and then CIP or C1P, I think it's a C1P. We talk about it later leads to increase in fat cell size. So fewer, larger fat cells make us more insulin resistant. He calls it sick fat because they leak inflammatory proteins, causes insulin resistance and increase in it. So this four HNE, that one right there, um, four, I'm going to butcher the name for hydroxy um, and it's made what's more important is it's made of polyunsaturated fat like omega-6 fat and reactive oxy oxygen molecules or oxidative stress. So this molecule that pushes fat to grow in size instead of number is made of polyunsaturated fat and oxidative stress. Now, specifically linoleic acid is a polyunsaturated, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid or PUFA. And it's the single most consumed fat in the standard American diet. It's the main fat in processed foods. It's found in vegetable and seed oils like sunflower, safflower, soybean, corn, and canola oils and food fried in them. And it's also found in lower concentrations in nuts and seeds. This is one of the reasons why fried food is unhealthy and why if you're doing keto, it's important to do like a clean keto or any fats that you eat. We want them to be healthy fats because the unhealthy fats create more of these four H and E molecules, which will drive, um, fat cell growth. And especially we have to talk about the concentration of it. It's so much more concentrated in these processed vegetable and seed oils than it is in the nuts and seeds from whole foods. And then the C one P ceramide one phosphate, it's a result of inflammation. 
And from my research, this is the only thing that I have found, um, against saturated fats. And it only happens with inflammation. So once inflammatory pathways are activated, long chain saturated fatty acids, which are found in most of the, the foods that we think of with saturated fat, like, um, most of, most of the fat in coconut butter, cheese, meat, et cetera, become the dangerous fats called ceramides. And I, when I was reading through this, I got, I came, became fascinated with ceramides. So I'm definitely going to do a video on that next year that actively work against insulin signaling in cells. So this is the only piece of evidence that I can find against saturated fat. And I'm going to show you more that shows the benefits of saturated fat later in this presentation. And it's only dangerous in the presence of inflammation tissues where these ceramides accumulate become insulin resistant. Okay. What else in increases in, uh, insulin resistance is inflammation. So if you have asthma or other autoimmune diseases that will increase your inflammation, which increases insulin resistance and then oxidative stress. So first, second, and third hand smoke, third hand smoke is there's no longer any smoke in the air, but you can still smell the chemicals of the smoke. That's actually been shown to increase oxidative stress, nicotine, including gum and e-cigs, a diet high in unhealthy fat, like that linoleic acid, which is the PUFA that I talked about a diet high in sugar, alcohol, pollution, radiation, certain pesticides and cleaners. So in summary, look at all of these factors here that increase insulin. What in increases insulin resistance is insulin. What increases insulin is what, and when we eat, how we move our bodies, sleep quality and quantity medications that raise blood sugar, like statins, epinephrine and cortisol from stress, thyroid hormone, genetics, ethnicity, age, central obesity, or visceral fat, fat cell hypertrophy from 4-HNE and C1P inflammation and oxidative stress. That may be a little disheartening, but I want you to focus on what's changeable there and what's not changeable there. You can't change your genetics. You can't change your ethnicity. You can't change your age. You can change what, and when you eat, you can change how you move your body. You can change how you sleep. You can reduce your medications by changing those other things. You can manage your stress better. So there's, there's so much that's in your control to reduce insulin resistance. So how did we get here? This is interesting. In the 1940s, the government put this out and it said for health, eat some from each food group every day. Well, let's look at these food groups. Group one is green and yellow vegetables. Group two, oranges, tomatoes, and grapefruit. Group three was potatoes and other vegetables and fruits. Group four was milk and milk products. Group five was meat, poultry, fish, or eggs. Group six was bread, flour, and cereals. And group seven was butter and fortified margarine. Again, for health, eat some food from each group every day. But then you got to look at the fine print because it says, in addition to the basic seven, eat any other foods you want. Thanks, U.S. Department of Agriculture, for that awesome science based information. And it gets better. It does actually get a little better. Uh, in the 1990s, they have this food pyramid. And this is what I learned in health class. This is what I tried to follow in high school and college. Um, and so Brett, maybe not college, but certainly in high school, the bottom of the food pyramid recommended that we get six to 11 servings of bread, cereal, rice, and pasta every day. All of these are refined carbohydrates that spike insulin and contribute directly to weight gain how crazy now carbohydrate, right? Two to five servings of vegetable, more carbohydrate, two to four servings of fruit, more carbohydrate, two to three servings of milk, yogurt, and cheese, not very much carbohydrate in there. And then hardly any in this two to three servings of meat, poultry, fish, dry beans, eggs, and nuts. But then at the fat or excuse me at the top, it says fat naturally occurring and added, and then sugars added sugars use, you know, use sparingly this directly told Americans eat a low fat diet in 2011, they updated it to choose my plate. 
I read this like this carbs, 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 grains are carbs, fruits are carbs, vegetables are carbs. And again, like avocados are a fruit and they're mostly fat. Olives are a fruit. They're mostly fat. It's not a hundred percent carbs, but you know, more than three quarters of the plate are probably carbs. And then a little bit of protein and a little bit of dairy, no fat. They are still, if you look on the American heart association or, um, big, you know, that like the American diabetes association, they still recommend a low fat diet. They have their foot in their mouth, trying to figure out how are we going to undo decades of misinformation? So we'll see what they end up doing. What I suggest is that you forget about food groups and focus on macronutrients. Food groups are made up. There are no vegetable fruit, um, car, you know, grain cell receptors. There are, there are ways that your body digests carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And that's what I'm going to teach you right now. So what are macronutrients? A macronutrient is a type of food required in large amounts for growth and development. And those include carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and water. Micronutrients are compounds needed in small amounts to enable the body to function correctly, such as vitamins and minerals. So this is a food label. And then I like the carb manager app to track my macros. Um, some people prefer my fitness pal. This is a snapshot of a carb manager screen. And then this is a, a snapshot of a food label. So when you're looking at macronutrients, I like tracking them because it just shows you right away your protein, your fat, your net carbs, your total carbs, fiber is just total carbs minus, or excuse me, net carbs is total carbs minus the fiber. So you can calculate all this manually, but I think it's so much easier just to look at a screen. So here we have total fat, total carbohydrate, fiber, protein, you can break it down even further, but I just wanted to point out like, where are the macronutrients on these food labels? This is from Dr. Bickman's book. This is a graph that shows how different macronutrients affect insulin. Three main types of carbohydrates. There are starches, sugars, and fiber. Now this graph, this spike here, uh, that's just for starch and sugar. Fiber has a negative insulin insulin response because it slows digestion. So when you think of this graph, I want you to think of the things on that bottom of the food pyramid, the bread, the rice, the pasta, the cereal, things that have a lot of flour or sugar. Um, it's going to spike your insulin. Okay. Protein is that solid gray line here. It has a moderate insulin response, but still pretty low. And then fat has next to nothing. So again, here's a little carbohydrates overview. There's soluble and insoluble fiber. When we talk about sugar, I think it's easiest to break it down into the molecules. So single molecules of sugar include glucose, fructose, and galactose. And then when you put two of those together, you get what's called a disaccharide. So we have monosaccharides and disaccharides. The disaccharides would be lactose, and that's one molecule of glucose plus one molecule of galactose and sucrose, which is one molecule of glucose plus one molecule of fructose. Sucrose is table sugar. And I'm going to show you later that there's really not that much of a difference between things like sucrose and high, high fructose corn syrup. It's glucose plus fructose is that that's the sucrose and then starch. So fiber, sugar, starch, starch is a polysaccharide, many molecules of glucose just strung together. And that's why sometimes you'll hear starch is just sugar because it is, it's a bunch of, a bunch of glucose or single sugar molecules joined together. What's really important here is to recognize that glucose, I think it's on the next slide. Mm, it's coming up. So let's talk about function first for fiber. The soluble fiber lowers fat and cholesterol absorption, stabilizes blood sugars and reduces the risk of heart disease. Insoluble fiber prevents and treats constipation, reduces your risk of hemorrhoids and colorectal cancer. Both are going to help with weight management and lowering your risk for disease. And then starch and sugar are just pretty much empty calories for energy. When it comes to digestion, 
Soluble fiber easily dissolves in water and turns into a gel like substance that's digested by bacteria in the large intestine and it releases gas and a few calories. Insoluble fiber does not dissolve in water and it's left intact as it moves through the GI system and it adds bulk to your, bulk to your stool. And because it's not really digested, it's not a source of calories. Here's what you need to know. Glucose, that simple monosaccharide glucose can be absorbed anywhere in the body and, um, excess obviously will be stored as body fat, but fructose must be absorbed in the liver. There's a small amount that's absorbed elsewhere, but primarily fructose is metabolized, absorbed right in the liver. And it rapidly turns to liver fat. It can only handle so much at a time. It does not have a bunch of storage space in the liver starch. Again, it's just broken down into the glucose and it can be stored as body fat wherever. This is why added sugar is so harmful to our health because half of it has to be metabolized in the liver and it directs directly, um, is turned into liver fat, which can lead to insulin resistance in the liver. So a note on sugar or sucrose. There are only four grams or one teaspoon of sugar circulating in your blood at any given moment, homeostasis, right? In 2015, the world health organization recommended adults limit their sugar, their added sugar intake to no more than about 5% of their daily energy intake. And that equates to about 26 grams of added sugar per day. Now, four grams is one teaspoon of sugar, and we should not have more than 26, according to the world health organization. But the problem is that caloric sweeteners like sugar, high fructose, corn syrup, et cetera, are in over 95% of a lot of processed foods like cakes, cookies, pies, granola, protein, and energy bars, ready to eat cereals, snacks, and sugar sweetened beverages. And it's not always obvious because of marketing. So a can of Pepsi has 41 grams of added sugar or 10.25 teaspoons. Okay. So in our blood, there's only one teaspoon. When you drink a can of Pepsi, your body has to deal with nine teaspoons of, or excuse me, 10 teaspoons of sugar to maintain that homeostasis. That's why that blood sugar spikes and that insulin spikes to push it into the cells into storage right away. A Gatorade has 34 grams of added sugar or 8.5 teaspoons. Now a Snickers bar has the same amount of added sugar as a cliff bar and these nature's bakery fig bars, 20 grams or five teaspoons of added sugar. We have to pay attention to what's on the back of the label, not the front. Do not give into food marketing that makes you think it's healthy just because it shows these grains and a raspberry and a guy surfing and, you know, active it's, it's, you have to look at the ingredients and the, the food panel to determine the health of your food. Sugar begets sugar, really sweet things beget sweet things. In my opinion, eating too much sugar in any form will shift the hunger satiety continuum. This is fascinating because the fast dopamine, which is your feel good hormone hit that you get with sugar makes you want more. There's strong evidence supporting the notion that hyper palatable foods, notably those high in added sugar can induce reward and craving that are at least comparable to addictive drugs. That's a really striking quote from this study from 2013 sugar does not trigger satiety hormones. Remember how we were talking about that peptide YY and CCK. Those are triggered by fat and protein, not starch and sugar. That's why we always have room for dessert. It's so easy to overeat after dinner on dessert because those don't trigger satiety that we don't, they only trigger satiety in the, in the sense of your stomach stretching out a little bit more, but they don't trigger those hormones. When we're talking about protein, that's just chains of amino acid or building blocks. And there are 20 amino acids, nine of which are essential, which means that they cannot be made from fats and carbs in your body. You have to get them from food. And then I've listed out the essential amino acids. The one I want you to pay attention to is leucine. 
Okay. That one's the most important one for laying down new muscle. There's a leucine threshold that we need to reach in order to stimulate our muscle to grow. Now, the best sources of essential amino acids are animal proteins. That's why often animal proteins are called complete proteins because they have a complete amino acid profile. So things like meat, eggs, and poultry. When you're talking plant-based sources, tofu or tempa soy products also are a complete protein. So protein is important for structure in your body, like your muscle, your hair, your collagen, enzymes, and antibodies. It's required for tissue growth and repair. Protein makes up about 50% of the volume of bone and about one third of its mass. Protein can be converted to glucose if needed for energy. And there's a lot of weight control benefits for protein, like an increased feeling of fullness. Again, it triggers those satiety hormones, increased muscle mass for a higher basal metabolic rate. It has a higher therm thermogenic effect of food, which I'll cover in a second, reduced glycemic response of carbohydrates. So if you eat protein with your carbohydrates, they will have a reduced glycemic response or blood sugar and insulin response. And then lower insulin response compared with starch and sugar. What is that diet induced thermogenesis? I think I just said it here, a higher thermogenic effect of food with protein. Let's talk about that a little bit more diet induced thermogenesis is related to the stimulation of energy requiring processes to absorb, metabolize and store the food. So how much energy does it take to break your food down? In healthy subjects with a mixed diet, the diet induced thermogenesis or DIT represents about 10% of all the calories we burn in a day or the total energy expenditure. So here are reported DIT values for separate nutrients, zero to 3% for fat, five to 10% for carbohydrate, and then 20 to 30% for protein, 10 to 30% for alcohol. So if you're having a hundred calories of fat, zero to three of those calories will be used to absorb, metabolize, and store the fat. If you're having hundred calories of carbohydrate, five to 10 of those calories will be used to digest that. If you're having hundred, hundred calories of protein, it's going to be 10 to 20, excuse me, 20 to 30 calories of those hundred are used to process and use the protein. Here's a nice graph that I like on what is total energy expenditure. So this is your resting metabolic rate. That's like the household items for heart rate, breathing, blood pressure, just maintaining your body it takes a lot of energy. Usually I see about 60%, 50 to 60%. That's going to depend on your age, your sex, your amount of muscle mass, your hormonal status. And then about 10% is that thermic effect of food. And this is activity energy or activity and energy expenditure. So exercise is actually from what I've read about 10% of your total energy expenditure. And then this is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So that's why just being active throughout the day, even if it's not structured exercise is great for your metabolism, especially after you eat. If you can go for a short walk after you eat, you're going to pull some of that blood sugar um, into your cells to use right away and require less insulin. I don't really care too much about the thermic, thermic effective meals. I think maybe over time it could add up, but relatively speaking, that's a pretty small um, percentage of your overall metabolism. So let's talk about dietary fat. This, this is a, a doozy in my, in my online program, I have an entire lesson on fat that's pretty in depth, but I'm going to give you the, the nuts and bolts here. It's broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. It's used for energy storage, making cholesterol cell membranes and hormones. You need fat. And there's quite a few weight benefits depending on the type of fat. So healthy fats have the lowest insulin response of all macronutrients and it triggers your satiety hormones. Unhealthy fats increase inflammation and ultimately raise insulin. And I'm going to talk about which ones are healthy and unhealthy, but as a reminder, this is a picture of your cell membrane. So all of your cells have, you know, are made, they're like a little sphere made of this made of cell membrane. 
And these are fats and these are proteins. So you are mostly fat and protein. Okay. Here's some different types of dietary fat. I like this picture. There's saturated fats and it, it depends on where this, um, like on the carbon atoms, it depends on where the carbon and hydrogen are on, like if it's determined a monounsaturated, a polyunsaturated, that's depending on the double bond that you can see there in the picture. And then trans fats is more related to the configuration of the molecules. So saturated fats are solid at room temperature. They have a high melting point, things like coconut oil and butter or animal fats. Monounsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature, like olive oil. They have a lower melting point. Polyunsaturated fats are also liquid at room temperature. Again, those are things like the safflower oil, canola oil. Trans fats are liquid oils that have been industrially um, converted into solids, partial, partially hydrogenated. Um, so you're adding hydrogen to cause the oils to become a solid. So very shelf stable. Um, they are in a lot of processed foods. Um, and there's, uh, they're found some naturally in uh, whole foods like animal foods, but we don't need to worry about those ones. We need to worry about the ones that are uh, made in a lab essentially. So let's talk about which ones of those fats are healthy. So like amino acids, there are essential and non-essential fatty acids. Monounsaturated fats uh, include omega-9 fatty acids, and these are non-essential. They can, and again, most foods have a combination of these. When I put the food on there, that's just like the majority of the type of fat. So omega-9 fatty acids are great for us. They're found in avocado, avocado oil, olives, olive oil, peanuts, cashews, hazelnuts, walnuts, pistachios, and almonds. Polyunsaturated fat is one of the essential fatty acids. Um, well, okay. So omega-6 and omega-3 are polyunsaturated fats and they are essential. You want to get them from whole food sources. So whole food sources of omega-6 fatty acids would be cashews, almonds, walnuts, hazelnuts, peanuts, and sunflower seeds. Whole food sources of omega-3 fatty acids would include green algae like spirulina, fatty fish like salmon, herring, mackerel, trout, sardines, tuna, and halibut, flax seeds, flaxseed oil, chia seeds, avocados, avocado oil, olives, I mean, olive oil, cashews, walnuts, and almonds. So here's a note about plant versus animal-based omega-3 fatty acids. A diet high in omega-6 fatty acids can contribute to inflammation. Very well known that that was from a study in 2020. So humans evolved on a diet with a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 essential fatty acids of about one, whereas most of the Western diets, because they're so high in that linoleic acid from like canola oil and fried foods, our ratio is closer to 16 to one, which really favors inflammation versus um, anti-inflammatory properties of those polyunsaturated fats. And it's why it's so important to get the saturated fats from or excuse me, the unsaturated fats, the omega threes from salmon or other fatty fish or green algae is because that is EPA and DHA. And those are the types of omega threes that are anti-inflammatory plant sources. If I back up the slide and we look at plant sources from omega three fatty acids, you're talking about flax seeds, flaxseed oil, chia seeds, avocado, avocado oil, olives, olive oil, cashews, walnuts, almonds, there's less than a 15% conversion rate to the types of fats that are actually anti-inflammatory. So they're good for you, but they're not as good for you as nutritionally dense and anti, um, and they don't have as many anti-inflammatory properties as fatty fish and microalgae like spirulina. So I consider saturated fats to be neutral. I think that there's a ton of research on this. Nina Teichel wrote a really good book, the big fat surprise. Um, I've interviewed her and, you know, there's just a lot of research that show saturated fats have been demonized unrightfully. So yes, they increase your total cholesterol, but they do so because they increase. And when I talk about cholesterol, I talk about the carriers of cholesterol. So the lipoproteins, 
they increase large buoyant LDL and they decrease small dense LDL. And in Dr. Bickman's book, he talks about the large buoyant LDL are like big beach balls inside your blood vessels. They don't cause a lot of damage bouncing around, but the small dense LDL are like golf balls and they will kind of bang into your arterial walls walls and cause more inflammation. So pattern a LDL means that you're biased towards more large buoyant LDL pattern B means you're biased towards more small dense LDL saturated fat reduces the unhealthy kinds of LDL increases the healthy kinds of LDL and it increases HDL saturated fat is one of the only nutrients they found that can actually increase HDL, which we know is protective for heart health. So the only reason that saturated fat was demonized was because back in the day before they had really the technology to measure LDL particle size and understand what that meant, total cholesterol was thought to be an indicator, a, a predictor of heart disease, but it's truly not. So I'm, we're, we're going to talk about that, that saturated fat has never been uh, clearly associated with heart disease or, um, to, it's just really interesting research. That's a big barrier that I work with, with women to overcome their fear of fat. And I think once you know the science behind it, you become less fearful to include more animal-based products and foods. Um, because again, it actually improves your metabolic profile. Unhealthy fats would be processed and refined omega-6 fatty acids like canola, soybean, corn, safflower, and other seed and vegetable oils found in many salad dressings and processed foods. So those salad dressings can be tricky because they can be canola oil and a bunch of sugar. So you have your, maybe you have your protein and your veggies, and you're topping it with unhealthy oil and sugar. So I really recommend making your own salad dressings with avocado or olive oil. Then trans fats, some are found naturally in food. Again, those are okay, but the industrial partially hydrogenated oils are unhealthy. And these would include margin. I can't believe it's not better. And many processed foods that contain them. So like Crisco, unfortunately, um, my beloved neighbor who moved away recently made the best chocolate chip cookies and she did use Crisco in her recipe and they were delicious, even though I knew they were not the healthiest source of fat for me. And they have been directly linked to increasing cardiovascular disease. So saturated fats and cholesterol. I talked about this a little bit. I'm going to repeat it here. The aspect of dietary saturated fat that is believed to have the greatest influence on cardiovascular risk is elevated concentrations of LDL cholesterol. That's what we believe for so long. You'll see it still on major medical websites, but the reduction in LDL cholesterol from reducing saturated fat intakes intake seems to be specific to large buoyant type a LDL particles. When in fact it is the small dense type B particles that are responsive to carbohydrate in, intake that are implicated in cardiovascular disease. That means that eating a diet higher in sugar increases those small dense type B LDL particles and increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. So much actually research suggests that saturated fats may be protective against heart disease, especially if you're able to keep your inflammation low. Recent studies have not supported any significant association between saturated fat intake and cardiovascular risk. Instead, saturated fat has found to be protective. The source of saturated fat may be important. The more unprocessed the dairy and meat, the better. However, when saturated fats are replaced with refined carbohydrates, like what started to happen in 1977 after the McGovern report, specifically added sugars like sucrose or high fructose corn syrup, the end result is not favorable for heart health and include the following. So here's a chart. When you in, when you replace saturated fat with sugar, here's what you get. You get more small dense LDL, reduced HDL, increased triglycerides, increased glucose, increased insulin resistance and leptin resistance and liver disease. In my opinion, we've been demonizing saturated fat when we need to be, um, 
I don't want to say demonizing, but encouraging people to eat less added sugar. I'm never an all or nothing mindset person. So the mono, this, this is a chart that shows you the percentage of glucose and fructose. Those are those monosaccharides in different sweeteners like brown rice syrup, cane sugar, beet sugar, brown sugar, molasses, coconut sugar, dates, date syrup, date sugar, raw honey, high fructose corn syrup. There's um, different percentages of uh, fructose there, depending on the syrup, maple syrup and agave, and then non-caloric sweeteners at the bottom. So the monosaccharide fructose and fructose containing sweeteners like sucrose and high fructose corn syrup produce greater degrees of metabolic abnormalities than does glucose either isolated or as a starch. So that's important. Just like I said earlier, and there's a picture up next on the reason that is, is because fructose must be metabolized in the liver. It has a limited capacity. It contributes to liver insulin resistance. But if you think that you're being healthy because you're using agave or maple syrup or honey instead of sugar, you're not because those actually have more fructose than just regular sugar. So I am not going to go over all of this. This, this slide shows a healthy liver and then different progressions of liver disease. So we have a fatty liver, a, a fatty liver that's also inflamed and then um, cirrhosis. But what's important that I want you to see here is that early stages of liver disease, again, caused a lot of times by this insulin resistance are reversible. That is why type two diabetes and heart disease and, and liver disease, like you guys, if you catch them early enough, you can reverse them. So what do we do about it? You know, we talked about what causes insulin resistance. Let's talk about some of the solutions. Insulin friendly food. These come directly from Dr. Ben Bickman's book, why we get sick. And he says to eat these until you're satisfied. So fats and oils, avocado, you're going to see after you learn like what oils are healthy, what are neutral, what are unhealthy. And I would honestly buy a saturated fats more towards healthy but until I do more research on ceramides, I'm going to keep them in the neutral category. So he suggests eating avocado oil, ghee, coconut oil, lard or rendered animal fat, extra virgin olive oil, MCT oil, and fish oil until, the, until you're satisfied. Limit your dairy intake if you have sensitivities, but you can also include butter, unprocessed cheese, cottage cheese, um, full fat, low sugar, Greek yogurt, cream cheese and heavy cream for dairy, for protein, all meats like beef, lamb, and game fish and seafood, all poultry, like chicken and Turkey, tofu and tempa and eggs, eat the egg yolks, more insulin friendly food, vegetables and fruits. You're going to aim for vegetables that grow above the ground and then fruits that are lower in sugar and higher in fiber and berries are on the list. They're just coming up next. So artichoke hearts, lemons, asparagus, limes, avocados, mushrooms, olives, bok choy, onion, celery, bell peppers, jalapenos, cucumber, radishes, green leafy vegetables like arugula, chard, lettuce, and spinach, watermelon, and herbs. And then fermented foods are great too, like apple cider vinegar, sauerkraut, kimchi, and pickles. For beverages, keep it to coffee, um, unsweetened coffee with, um, nut or seed milks, like almond or coconut is fine. I use half and half in my coffee. Still, you can just use the heavy cream kombucha. If it doesn't have a lot of added sugar, sparkling waters, um, again, that don't have unhealthy artificial sweeteners or, um, natural sweeteners and then tea for condiments stick with these, um, sugar substitutes. I'll call them erythritol, stevia, monk fruit, and xylitol, and then salad dressings without uh, vegetable oils or sugar. You can also find mayonnaise that's not made with canola oil. So these are insulin friendly, but he recommends limiting them to two or fewer servings a day based on their insulin response. So they likely are higher in carbohydrate lower in fiber, protein, and fat than the other nutrients that he says to enjoy until you're satisfied. 
So they would include nuts, seeds, and legumes like almonds, peanuts, almond flour. And as, as a side note too, some of these would be higher in those omega-6 uh, fatty acids, which could be why he recommends limiting to two or a few ser servings a day. Almonds, peanuts, almond flour, and coconut flour, pecans, flax seeds, pine nuts, hazelnuts, pumpkin seeds, macadamia nuts, sunflower seeds, nut butters, walnuts, beans, and bean pastas. For protein, bacon with no added preservatives or starch, with no added preservatives or starches, pow and powdered protein supplements. Vegetables, fruits, and grains barley, pearls, cauliflower, berries, like blackberries, blueberries, cranberries, raspberries, strawberries, edamame, bean sprouts, eggplant, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, okra, cabbage, and snap peas. For beverages, again, we're still at the limit to two or a few servings a day. Alcoholic beverages, um, preferably that don't have a bunch of added sugar. So like dry wines, clear alcohols, low carb beer or seltzer waters with low insulin sweeteners whole milk flavored fruit drinks with non-caloric sweeteners like the Bi or the Zevia. Condiments, Greek yogurt dips, salad dressings containing two or fewer carbs or starches, hummus, and then sugar alcohol sweeteners like maltitol or sorbitol. So those would be unhealthy. Like those are less healthy than those first four sweeteners that I just told you about erythritol, stevia, monk fruit, and xylitol. Now avoid when possible or eat less than daily. I am so anti-diet. I'm just it's like, if you are going to go the rest of your life without having any unhealthy food, then by all means don't have unhealthy food. But if you're not, you need to learn how to eat unhealthy food as part, part of a healthy lifestyle. So I'm going to really emphasize eat less than daily canola oil, soybean oil, margarine, trans fat, peanut oil, and food fries in them foods that are fried in them. Avoid low fat dairy, um, avoid condensed milk, skim or low fat milk, high sugar ice creams, avoid and limit any proteins that are breaded or served with sugary sauces. Um, and then pretty much all other fruits, vegetables, and grains not yet listed, which makes up the majority of the, my plate from the government recommendation, which is why we are, um, why we're at, uh, why we have, you know, 85% of adults who have insulin resistance over seven out of 10 adults are overweight or obese because we've been following these recommendations. When in reality, we should be eating those foods probably less than daily. So when you do have these, like say bananas, and I do have bananas almost every day. However, I'm younger. I have a higher metabolism, more muscle mass. You can tolerate more carbohydrates if you're more active. Um, but I used to have, you know, a whole banana every day. I've cut it back to a half. I used to have all the fruit that I wanted, and I certainly don't do that anymore. But when I have fruit, I try to do a whole fruit source versus processed. Um, and then I aim for the higher fat protein and fiber. And that goes for all of it. Like the vegetables, the, the whole grains, the fruits, that's why tracking your macros can be really beneficial. So you see, well, how much, you know, fat protein and fiber, um, might be in this peach or might be in this potato. So it's just a really good educational tool, more things to avoid when possible or eat less than daily alcohol, including most beer, sweet wines, mixtures, and cocktails, a lot of added sugar and empty calories and alcohol. Um, it's also going to affect how you digest the rest of your food. So soda or pop, um, including diet soda. Okay. So that's going to have the unhealthy sweeteners. Um, such as aspartame and chemicals that just really do alter metabolism. Many of them still have a blood sugar and insulin response, even though there's no calories in them. Fruit juice, right? Fruit juice. How many of us are feeding fruit juice to children? Please, please either water it down or just replace it with the milk or the water. Um, we do not need to be feeding our children all of this added sugar and sports drinks. Same thing condiments and sweeteners, agave, honey, aspartame, maple syrup, corn syrup, and high fructose corn syrup, sucralose, which is a really common, um, added sweetener, especially in quote unquote health foods. I'm seeing better from the food companies. I am seeing that they're trying to replace, um, sucralose with aspartame or not aspartame erythritol, um, or stevia. So that's, that's positive. Um, 
you're going to want to avoid or eat less than daily. Those the fructose and then sugar. So white and brown sugar. So that's some recommendations on low insulin foods or insulin friendly foods. Again, this graph comes from Dr. Bickman's book, but when we eat include like that matters too. You're actually like how insulin sensitive or insulin resistant you are, especially for a woman will vary quite a bit, but everyone has a circadian rhythm where we are, we digest carbohydrates best between about 12 and 3 PM. And so I recommend if you're going to eat carbohydrates, eat them in that, um, kind of midday range and reduce your carbs in the morning and at night. And then for women, you're going to be more insulin res resistant around the time of your cycle. That's why we always tend to gain a couple pounds around the time of our period. And then we lose it again. But when we fast insulin or your fat storage hormone goes down and glucagon or your fat burning hormone goes up. So on this side of the chart, we have frequent eating and a heart high carbohydrate diet will lead to a high insulin to glucagon ratio. What that does is it inhibits fat use, increases fat storage, inhibits liver glycogen use, increases liver glycogen or fat storage, inhibits ketogenesis and inhibits autophagy or cellular cleaning. But fasting and reducing carbohydrates leads to a low insulin to glucagon ratio, and that's going to activate fat use or lipolysis inhibits fat storage, activates liver glycogen use, inhibits liver glycogen storage, activates ketogenesis and activates, um, autophagy. Intermittent fasting is the most powerful strategy that you can use to reverse insulin resistance. So again, when we eat matters, we're more insulin resistant in the morning and at night, a uh, fun study that I found showed that subcutaneous adipose tissue, which is where we're supposed to store fat was 54% more insulin sensitive at noon versus midnight. So if you're eating hundred calories of popcorn at midnight versus um, at noon, your body's going to metabolize that differently and store more of it as fat at midnight. Numer numerous human studies have shown that intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding helps, helps to lower weight, glucose, and insulin. This is not a presentation on intermittent fasting. I have an entire module on that in my program, but for successful intermittent fasting, you have to take some things into consideration. The first is mindset. A lot of women come from a restrictive mindset and we have to view fasting as a tool, not restricting yourself as in past diets. So you have to balance that mindset feasibility with adequate protein. Um, what you eat after your fast may be just as important as the fast itself. You don't want to eat insulin spiking foods right after your fast. So adequate protein and lifestyle preferences. Like, well, when do you work? Um, when are you more, how's your sleep? How's your stress? Um, that's going to all play into the recommended fasting schedule. And you certainly don't have to do the same fasting schedule every day. I recommend at least a 12 to 14 hour fast every day. And then several days a week, I'll try to do a little bit longer one, like a 16 hour fast, eight hour feeding window. Once a week, I try to fast for 20 to 24 hours. Um, and then once a week I have like a feeding day where I might just fast 10 to 12 hours but that's just me. Everyone's different. And everyone, everyone's fasting schedule will be very individualized. So sleep is important for insulin resistance too. nighttime eating is associated with reduced sleep duration and poor sleep quality, which can lead to insulin resistance and increased risk of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So this study from 2019 showed that inadequate sleep causes an increased sense of hunger increases daily caloric intake without changing energy expenditure leading to weight gain impairs insulin sensitivity, i.e. increases insulin resistance may cause brain activity changes in regions involving reward and cognitive control over eating. So you're going to be more hungry. You're going to want to eat more and you're going to have less like self-control or willpower to stop yourself. 
So sleep is so overlooked and so important for weight loss and overall health exercise. Again, it's not about the calories. It's about building muscle for, um, places to put glucose and activating these glute four transporters exercise removes glucose from the blood without insulin and exercise has been shown to increase glucose uptake and glute four protein content in skeletal muscle following muscle contraction. Okay. So it really is about how can we utilize exercise number one, to build muscle so that we have more insulin receptors, more healthy muscle to deposit glucose uh, quickly and easily. I also like to use exercise for stress management. And for that, it's really that lower to moderate intensity cardio and, or, and, or yoga or stretching and flexibility training. So cardio, um, is not king anymore. Minute for minute strength training improves insulin sensitivity better than cardio. So focus on that strength training. Exercise has also been shown to increase nitrous oxide release, and that improves vasodilation. That's why it's so good for blood pressure um, and endothelial health. The endothelium is the single cell layer on the inside of your blood vessels. And that's um, really where heart disease starts. It also, this is fascinating um, from the secret life of fat from uh, Sylvia Terra in 2017. I had her on the podcast too. It increases adiponectin to preferentially store subcutaneous versus visceral fat. So exercise is helpful for where we store our fat. It increases anabolic, anabolic hormones like testosterone, IGF one that's insulin, like growth factor one and human growth hormone for increased muscle growth and metabolism. And again, Dr. Bigman says minute for minute. Resistance training may be superior to improve insulin sensitivity. And he also says never miss a leg day because those legs, your glutes, your quads, your hamstrings, those are big muscles. And so you're going to get the most bang for your buck doing leg strengthening. So the bottom line here is when you're thinking about how do I lose weight? How do I keep it off? Stop saying I need to eat less and exercise more start saying, I need to lower insulin resistance. I need to live a low insulin lifestyle. Instead of asking yourself or looking at the food label or looking at your phone and saying, how many points does this have? How many calories does this have? First of all, recognize that weight gain is multifactorial. Food is just one, but also when you eat exercise, sleep, and stress are very important factors. And so with that, we're going to replace how many points or calories does this have with how will this affect my insulin? That is your litmus test for whether or not something is healthy. So what can you do? This is what I told the physical therapy students. I said, you can do your best to lead by example. You will have more credibility as a healthcare provider. If you yourself are healthy. And I think especially right now, burnout is very big in healthcare and we have to take care of ourselves to best care for our patients and our clients and our families. So spreading evidence-based information, I, you know, I'm doing this for my own health, but I, I'm also not at the same time, I'm doing this to really spread the word on insulin resistance. Um, and YouTube is a really great platform to do that along with this podcast. If you found this helpful, please subscribe to this channel share this interview with your family and friends. So screen for metabolic syndrome. This is something simple that any healthcare provider can really do. So the, the criteria for metabolic syndrome, and you don't have to have all of these to have metabolic syndrome, but a large waist. So for women, it's 35 inches or more. And for men, it's 40 inches or more high triglycerides of 150 or higher reduced HDL cholesterol less than 40 in men or less than 50 in women, increased blood pressure of 130 over 80 or higher, elevated fasting blood sugar of higher than hundred. Notice LDL is not on here. So why we keep focusing on LDL when it's not even a symptom um, or a symptom of metabolic syndrome, um, I think is a really interesting thing, you know? So next time you hear, oh no, my total LDL 
or my total cholesterol or LDL is up and my doctor wants to put me on a statin, question that and say, hey, let's do some more specific testing. Let's see what the, the particle size is. Let's do a coronary calcium scan. Um, I have an interview with a cardiologist coming out really soon. And that's a great one. If you want more information on what tests to get done before you decide to take a statin. So then with the students, we had a discussion on barriers. I would love to hear your um, feedback on this. Like what barriers do you think exist to implementing this low insulin lifestyle, these recommendations? I think the, the biggest one is our government is behind. Like we are putting out bad nutritional recommendations that still focus on low fat, high carbohydrate, plant-based I'm not anti-plant-based, but it is harder to live a low insulin lifestyle. If you're plant-based, it reduces your food variability, uh, food options significantly. So I think bad advice, I think big agencies like the American heart association, American diabetes association, they need to get behind the evidence. And whether that means admitting that they've been wrong for the last few decades, fine. But someone needs to hold them accountable. Nina Teicholz and her nutrition coalition are working really hard to hold those agencies accountable and to put out good science-based, um, nutritional, um, recommendations. You know, they're really digging through the research and saying, what does the research say now current research? I think another barrier is just uh, women are, we, we are so hard on ourselves. And I think that we have this perfectionistic all or nothing mentality we think that losing weight should happen fast. We've done diets in the past where we just starve ourselves or significantly reduce calories and they worked. And they think we think that's the only thing that's going to work for us. It's not as I've shown you that will crash your metabolism for six months to four years. There's a better way and it's living a low insulin lifestyle, but it takes a mindset change that you can eat fatty foods again, that you can be full again that you should be full because that means you're properly fueling your body, but that you can also feel hunger again. You can use intermittent fasting. You don't have to eat breakfast. The whole notion that breakfast boosts your metabolism. I debunked when I showed you that the only reason people say that is because it has some thermogenic effect of food, which is less than 10% of the total calories that you burn in a day. And it's more beneficial to fast through breakfast if you can, because it pushes that glucagon to insulin ratio. So I really, I hope that you enjoyed this presentation, just learning the science behind weight loss, um, why insulin resistance is such a critical factor to consider when we think long-term health and disease prevention. If you want to learn more, this is my email mnulty at weightlossforhealth.com. My website is weightlossforhealth.com. You can join my program and learn all of this, plus a lot of behavior change strategies. So this is, you know, some of the information in the modules of the course. So I have an entire module on how to follow through. How do we start something and actually consistently follow through for the rest of our life? An entire module on fuel and fasting and sleep and exercise and stress, but then the master classes really help my members apply it practically. So there's a master, there's a master class called mastering your habits. There's one on insulin resistance and inflammation. There's one on ending emotional eating. There's a master class on ending carbon sugar cravings, breaking through weight loss plateaus. And then how do we maintain our weight loss for life? And in addition to that, there's an online community and weekly office hours with me where I do live troubleshooting often on mindset because they get all the strategy similar to this, but more in depth and with fun sheets, like they can print them off and just have things right at their fingertips for how to implement. But I think that the coaching and the office hours are really beneficial because it gives you that human connection and that support that sometimes is needed when we're going countercultural here, when we're saying I'm not going to cut calories and starve myself anymore. I'm going to live a low insulin lifestyle. 
Thank you so much for watching this presentation. If you have any questions about insulin resistance or long-term weight loss, be sure to put them in the comments on YouTube. I have put my email here. If you have any follow-up questions, um, it's mnulty at weightlossforhealth.com. And then my website is weightlossforhealth.com. That's how you can join my program if you so desire. And here are the references. If you're listening to the podcast, just know that you can go to the YouTube video towards the end to see these. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can always pause them so you can read them. Here you go. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I hope that you learned a ton and got great value from this. Again, if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, I would greatly appreciate that. It helps the content get seen by more people and also share and like this video. I'll talk with you in the next one.